welcome to today's program. I am Kathy Brett with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenter will attempt to answer as many questions as she can during the time we have and will follow up on questions she does not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. Then you can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. And that email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Sharon Butler. Sharon is Chairman of Perioperative Pressure Ulcer Task Force, Chairman of COUNT PI Committee, Chair-elect of the Hospital Coordinating Council, and member of the Wisdom Council at Stanford University Hospital and Clinics in Stanford, California. Sharon was manager, educator, and designed Stanford's first electronic nurse record. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Sharon to begin today's presentation. Okay, hello, every, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be speaking to all of you today. I uh, just want to give you a little information about Stanford, where this um, project took place. We are a 500-bed academic medical center, and we're about 30 miles south of San Francisco, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, we're a level one trauma center, and we have uh, approximately um, 75 to 85% of the patients that actually come into Stanford uh, actually are uh, surgical patients. So we have 21 main operating rooms and 12 ambulatory operating rooms. So that just gives you a little idea about uh, the environment that I actually work in. So what we're going to talk about today is the importance of standardizing surgical skin asepsis protocol and developing strategies to actually implement a successful process. So I know all of you are aware of the fact that we have a major problem in the United States with... Sharon, if I may interrupt for a minute, can you share your PowerPoint so that the, the attendees may follow along? Okay. Um, my screen is up full screen, so just um, just downsize your your full screen and then go. There we go. Okay. Perfect. All right. Sorry You're about that. Okay. So um, associated uh, health uh, hospital acquired infection is a major problem today. Um, you will read all kinds of literature out there, and these numbers. Uh, were just chosen uh, in some of the articles that actually were reviewed. But the staggering figure is that 271 people die per day uh, in relationship to hospital-acquired uh, infections, of which surgical site infections is one of those. I just reviewed an article um, the, earlier this month from JAMA which actually talked about the um, hospital-acquired infections that we really look at, such as central line uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias um, and urinary tract infections, and, of course, surgical site infections. Of all of those, surgical site infections represent 37% of hospital-acquired infections, and the cost is staggering to me, $3 billion a year. And as we're all acutely aware, Medicare is not reimbursing us for hospital-acquired infections. And 
I'm sure other uh, insurance companies are getting on board with that. The idea is that if, if we cause it, obviously we uh, need to actually uh, not charge for that type of infection. And one controllable um, item, and it's just one, and that's the one that we're going to talk about today, is looking at pre-surgical um, asepsis protocols. Kathy, I can't move my... Uh, There we go. Sarah, you, okay. Uh, I know. Um, so what we always need to focus on is the patient. We always need to be looking at patient-focused care. And if we're not, we really need to step back and look at um, patient focus for our care. So by standardizing things, we hope that we can have less waste, and have fewer errors because if you have fewer things to pick from, the better, you, the better the, uh, is for the uh, health professional. And certainly all of us want to send our patients home with healthy incisions that are healing and are not going to cause them problems. That makes it for a happy surgical team, and it also makes for a happy uh, uh, patient as well. So I know all of you are acutely aware of the uh, some of the buzzwords nowadays, and certainly culture of safety is one of those uh, terms that we really are looking at. We want to make sure that all of our caregivers feel comfortable talking about um, how our care is rendered. And if they see something that they don't believe is being done properly, that they have uh, the freedom to stand up and say, um, you know, I, I don't think that's the way that the uh, procedure is meant to be carried out and things like that. Uh, I'm sure all of you have had uh, requests for surveys on culture of safety within your organizations to monitor whether, in fact, your staff do feel like um, they are comfortable with um, speaking up and uh, suggesting uh, that things are not being done correctly. And whenever you implement any of these projects, uh, whether it be skin asepsis or whatever project, you have to make sure that you have the right stakeholders at the table in order for it to be successful. And most of the time it needs to be uh, many people um, and sometimes you invite people from the outside to actually work on some of these projects. So this particular team really started at a very high level. It was the um, surgical quality group, the surgeon's quality group and the infection control practitioners that really wanted to narrow down the prepping agents that we actually uh, were using. And so that's how the project started, along with the um, nursing uh, top leadership uh, in the perioperative environment. So when we start out doing any of these projects, uh, especially nowadays, another one of the buzzwords that's out there is evidence-based practice. So we need to start with what are the best protocols for the patient and reviewing um, those in the literature, making sure that we have good sound uh, foundation for the change of uh, practice. And, of course, you have to also have a plan for how are we going to reinforce this um, and making sure that uh, things are in place for compliance and being willing to deal with uh, personnel um, that are not uh, in compliance with what the protocol has 
uh, change to. We do want to make sure that it is cost effective, so that needs to be evaluated as well. And then we need to have some kind of a tracking system so we can decide, was this the right change? Um, was, does it need modification? Um, is it going to get the results that we actually uh, want as far as this project is concerned? So in this case, it, it's very beneficial to us that a lot of outside agencies have been very involved in uh, determining what is best practice for surgical skin asepsis prior to uh, incision. And as you can see from this slide, there are some very high-powered uh, organizations that we really rely on to help make the decisions. And also, um, it provides very good support for all of our practitioners, surgeons, as well as nursing staff, to know that we um, are following national guidelines as far as our change in practice is concerned. So one of the first ones that we looked at was the National Quality Forum. And they actually did support uh, very highly um, the um, CHG 2% uh, with alcohol. And of course, they actually talk about the fact that it can't be used on um, young children. That's not an issue for us in our organization because all of the children are done at our sister hospital of Lucille Packard. Um, also, uh, once again, and this is critical because uh, we need to make sure that things are applied and that we do know that there are hazards to uh, any time you have alcohol and electrical current. I'm sure that you're all aware of that. And certainly fire safety is another whole topic of discussion um, for safety practices in the operating room. The AORN guidelines, this one actually uh, I took from 2011, but I did just review the 2013, and it hasn't changed. Um, I also went back and looked at some of the earlier text and recommended practices. And this basically has been the statement from AORN um, since the beginning of the recommended practices being presented. So once again, you'll see the same thing over and over again in these um, national uh, guidelines for uh, practice. We want something that is rapid, it's rebounding. Uh, we want it to act quickly and um, remove the transient organisms. So the infection control practitioner, uh, once again, very close relationship with the uh, AORN. Um, and pretty much we're using AORN's recommendations as far as um, what we want to see in the agents that we are actually using for uh, prepping patients. Once again, they did point out that CHG uh, is an uh, excellent product with rebound and persistence. And certainly that is uh, one of the things that we really need to uh, look at um, is the persistence. The CDC also uh, talks about uh, the very same things, as I say. So we're all on the same place. We want it to be rapid. We want it to be persistent. and so, um, and once again, they identify the three uh, most common agents of alcohol, iodophores, and CHG. And what we find is the best is combining the alcohol and the other two products. So alcohol and iodophore, hexidine, gluconate, and alcohol. So you get the rapid as well as the persistence with those. So as we can see, um, a lot of national agencies have all supported uh, these same uh, goals. So what you see on this table is just kind of a breakdown of just exactly what we have just talked about in the fact, oops, excuse me. Um, 
is that we want it to be rapid and we want it to um, what the mechanics are of it and then we also have to as I say look at some of the negative things and as we look at this you'll see that one agent does not meet all of our needs so this is a comparison table of uh, the products and all of these products are actually in use at Stanford uh, because of the fact that as I say you can't have one product we need something for the head and the face and for the face sometimes that's is minor uh, a prepping agent as baby shampoo and but for our primary uh, site in uh, incisions we wanted either alcohol and iodophore or alcohol and CHG and one of the things that I really do want to stress is the persistence of it at 48 hours and that's so beneficial because as we know the normal healing process of a primary closure of an incision usually the incision is sealed and closed within 24 hours and we just would like another 48 hours of persistence around there uh, for a sepsis to uh, take place so but you also have to have something for the mucous membranes uh, obviously you need something for your eye cases and, and um, those specialty uh, preps that need to be done. So um, what the leadership decided was that there were some prepping agents that needed to be removed from the um, department and they wanted to actually narrow down the primary prepping agents do just two products uh, with other products being available as I say for the specialty um, uh, procedures so um, once again infection preventionists really supported CHG with um, alcohol although we knew that we were not going to be able to get rid of our iota force because you do need something to fall back on if in fact somebody is allergic to um, the uh, chlorhexidine so we actually um, didn't um, have any problem with those two products because they already still existed in the department and it was just a matter of eliminating um, some 3% iodine, 2% iodine, and 1% iodine that some of our orthopedic surgeons had used. So what we had was some, some historical uh, prepping uh, agents, um, and we just knew that the nurses were mixing these with alcohol and it was kind of like a cocktail party going on in, in some of these uh, uh, prepping uh, solutions so what we wanted was something that was commercially prepared so that it actually did have the same consistent properties for each uh, and every patient that was going to uh, have it placed uh, on them prior to surgery so we um, so that decision was made and when I heard about that um, that the uh, committee was uh, making this decision I went to the chairman of the um, quality committee of surgeons and said that the periop research nursing council would very much like to participate in this and he was very pleased that we were uh, interested in helping out with this and he said oh I'll send you the PowerPoint presentation that we actually used uh, for the surgeons and I said great and we actually uh, reviewed it at the periop research council meeting and decided that it just wasn't going to be something that we could just go with 
uh, that we were going to use some of what they had, but we needed to design our own. And the Periop Research Council was kind of a new entity for us, and we were still very much in a learning process of how to conduct a literature search. So we decided to do our own literature search. We didn't anticipate that we were going to find anything that would change this process, but it would just give us a lot more information so that when we developed our own presentation for the staff, we could basically answer questions and be uh, somewhat experts on the whole process. So we did um, put together our PowerPoint presentation. And then we set out to provide uh, education for the nurses um, and some of the surgeons and even the anesthesiologists. And we are very fortunate uh, that every Monday morning we have a delayed start time so we could capture a large number of our staff at that meeting. We also um, have a delay, or we have an afternoon meeting time for uh, our nursing and technical staff, and one can capture a big group of people at that time. And our goal was to review the literature as to what we found and identify the products that were actually going to uh, be used uh, for the um, from here on out. And you know, we also wanted to make sure that everybody was aware that um, the evidence did support these two uh, uh, agents. So, uh, and I talk about anesthesia being included in this, and they had kind of been brought on board early on because a number of years ago, in conjunction with central line infections, um, the core prep or the CHG prepping an alcohol-based uh, agent was actually placed into their bundle. So that is what uh, they prep their necks with um, it, before putting uh, in central line. So anesthesia was already on board. Now, we really didn't have to do a huge amount of information as far as the surgeons are concerned. But being a teaching hospital, we have faculty from the VA that come over to practice. We have surgeons that actually practice primarily in other um, hospitals, but they still come back. And plus the fact we have all of our resident staff that actually is moving around, going from facility to facility and service to service. So there definitely was education that needed to be done by the nurses uh, for the surgeons. Kind of at the same time as all this activity was going on in preparation for this changeover, there, was, there had been a decision made that we would actually start uh, the CHG uh, bathing operation uh, program um, prior to actually getting everything set in place for the inter-op portion. So each one of the uh, specialties would hand out to their patients, either in the physician's office or when they would come to the pre-anesthesia clinic, uh, to uh, have them actually utilize this, these cloths before they came to the operating room. And it was recommended that they had two applications uh, you know, two days prior to uh, using the um, using the cloth for two days prior to the uh, actual surgical day. And what we also did at that time was include in our electronic record that the nurse would record whether, in fact, the patient did acknowledge that they had done this. So the electronic record has been very helpful in this whole process. So. The next thing that we had to do as far as operating room staff was concerned is we needed to have our resource nurses actually go through all of our physicians' preference cards and make sure that either one of the products was on the uh, surgeon's preference list if, in fact, that was the appropriate thing. So if we, and we use custom packs for almost all of our, our surgical procedures. So 
uh, most of the prepping agents were placed into the custom pack. So we still, obviously, when we did a DNC, we weren't putting the alcohol and the CHG or iota for in. We were putting uh, the uh, scrub and paint uh, iota fours. And then uh, the basic kits um, also, if in fact they were used by similar services, once again, we could put our prepping agents into our kits. So that really reduced the amount of uh, storage that we needed for extra prepping kits and supplies. And then during this process of looking at the preference cards and just kind of looking at what we were what we had in our operating rooms, we had this kind of aha moment and it's we discovered that we were still using large multiple dose containers. And obviously there's no way you know you can tell whether they've been contaminated or not. So this was a perfect opportunity for us to actually uh, go to single dose um, containers for all of our prepping agents. So as you can see in the picture, we're basically looking at the small three ounce kind of containers. So if you want to take it on the plane, you could take it with you. So trying to communicate with everybody, even though we have you know uh, time reserved for service meetings, you always have people on vacation, and we really needed to get out to uh, as many people as possible. So we actually have two staff members that put out a, a weekly bulletin um, in the department. And so that was where one of the pieces of information uh, was disseminated. So you have to have multiple ways of disseminating this information. Key pieces of the uh, protocol were put into emails to the, the nursing staff so that they knew. Um, and then also we use our three S's, the scrub sink signs. And this year at ALRN, we discovered these really nice containers that would go uh, along the top of the scrub sink. They hold the scrub brushes, but they also have a drop-down clear uh, screen in front so that we can drop down um, our uh, scrub sink signs into these, and they're nicely protected from water and things like that. And there's multiple ones uh, across the scrub sink, so service people can use them as well. We don't get too busy with the signs there. You want to just give them the key points so while somebody's standing there scrubbing that they can uh, actually read what is going on with different changes that we're making uh, within the department. The other thing that um, we uh, continued to stress was that this was a decision made by upper level management um, and physicians, and it was supported by uh, infection control. So we really wanted to make sure that the nurses felt once again in a safe environment and that what they were doing was absolutely the correct thing. So to reinforce this, um, we just needed to make sure that there is adherence to the, the program. And so one of the things that we did also was to bring in our um, sales representatives uh, for the different products and actually have them review what the application process was for the different products. And um, so that not only were we using the correct products, but we were using them correctly um, so that the nursing staff once again felt comfortable with what was happening. And looking at compliance and reinforcement of that. And then we also had to actually remove all of the agents that we were no longer going to actually be using. And that um, actually worked out fairly well over a, a, a weekend. So 
we always need to make sure that we are tracking on uh, these processes. And certainly the electronic record has made this a much easier process for us. Um, and probably many of you are well aware that there are numerous of our surgical specialties that have required this information for a very long period of time. And so it's been, become much easier now because the nurses do record what they prep the patient with. That's nothing new, but it's now so easy to actually uh, obtain that information. And not only can we obtain the information, but we can also tie it to the wound classification uh, that we have. So we do want to make sure that the nurses uh, are using the correct uh, agents and not falling back into, oh, I want my patient prepped with uh, betadine, or the patient's abdomen with betadine and um, paint and scrub. We want them to either be using chlor chloroprep or duraprep for those uh, particular uh, surgical procedures. And, you know, posting information is, is vital because somebody will always come up and say, well, I didn't know anything about this. So um, we did want to make sure that um, the non-compliant products were removed. And so what happened was over one weekend, um, the orderly staff came in and all of those items were removed and replaced with the single dose um, containers. And that was very effective. And once those products, you know, really were, uh, had been removed, it was much easier for the nurses to say, well, that's no longer available here and this is the new prepping protocol that you need to be actually following. And we were very lucky in the fact that what happens is that we actually have nursing staff that have close relationship with veterinary hospitals and also uh, uh, staff that go on mission trips. So all of the unopened containers were either returned to the vendor or they were actually donated for those very things. So once again, it was a win-win a, a for uh, many of the uh, staff. So how this actually, this whole process uh, became uh, kind of global was the fact that we actually created a poster to take to AORM last year. And several of the uh, companies actually went around and uh, saw the poster and they contacted us uh, about doing a presentation in relationship to that. So th the posters are such a wonderful uh, venue to actually tell your staff and in this case, tell other uh, facilities what your process was. We actually have a wall uh, up close to our lounge area where we actually will post uh, these large posters for a, a period of time so that people do have an opportunity to read them and see what the whole process was all about. And once again, as I say, we actually utilize the scrub sink areas to actually um, present highlights of what's going on. Uh, and that actually includes uh, what our surgical site infection rates are um, so that all of the services can see if they have any issues around us. And I, I didn't mention when we started this, but we actually did not have a, uh, any kind of a problem with our surgical site infection rate. As a matter of fact, we uh, are lower than the national standards that you see reported, and we're lower than uh, the other hospitals that we're benchmarked against. But we knew that we needed to standardize things in order to be, once again, more effective and more cost effective. 
So we take every opportunity we can with the nurses because, as I said, we have uh, surgeons that actually are coming and uh, going um, from different hospitals, so they forget what they're supposed to be using uh, at Stanford, and the nursing staff are, are very comfortable stepping up now and saying, this is what you know we recommend, and this is what we found in the literature, so this is what we should be using. So um, as I say, many organizations, and certainly Medicare and Medi-Cal, actually ask us for reporting of infection rates to them. So what we wanted to see was uh, the first quarter report after we actually changed this, we wanted to make sure that we hadn't had an increase in infections, but we also knew that even if we saw a decrease in infections, we couldn't necessarily tie that to the change in the uh, prepping. And one of the things that was good at, at, for this process was uh, this was the only thing that we really changed at, in this quarter. Sometimes we actually, you know, make two or three changes at the same time, and that's obviously not good research technique because then you don't know which one of the uh, changes actually uh, affects the um, outcome. So, um, as I say, once again, we can track things so much easier now because of the electronic record. We can plug so many of the variables in and look at them. So not only can we look at what we prepped with, but you know, um, how long was the surgery, what was the wound classification, and all those. And that's been very beneficial to the infection uh, practitioners in uh, being able to look at things much easier, much more rapidly. Uh, it's not a labor-intensive process anymore. We can just write uh, any kind of report that we need for any of that. Um, and once again, just making sure that we reinforce um, what's going on. And I must say, um, we don't necessarily give a huge amount of feedback. It's kind of one of those things that if you don't hear anything, you uh, think, you make the assumption that everything is pretty much okay. And that's pretty much the standard, too. The management team gets all of the service managers get their uh, monthly reports as far as infection is concerned. And certainly, uh, if there is any kind of blip on the screen, then they talk to the teams that are uh, taking care of those patients and try to identify what um, area that um, we could, you know, make an adjustment or what actually is going on. Uh, has something changed uh, in relationship to uh, prepping the patients? Also, um, one of the things uh, that you can look at also is to identify, you know, good practice areas. One of the things that why we were so actually uh, supportive of uh, the CHG and um, alcohol product was the fact that a number of years ago, the cardiac team uh, had had a series of uh, sternal infections. And um, no, most of you may know that all the sternal incisions actually have to be followed. So the um, infection practitioners uh, requested that we make several changes to that uh, our prepping practices, our draping practices, and we did that. And the thing that we did use was the CHG uh, prep for the patients. And I'm happy to say that we have had rare amounts of uh, external infections over the last four or five years. So it, we already had some very positive experience with this uh, product. So overall, the change was, has really uh, moved forward. Um, and one of the things that I have to say, though, is you know, we weren't introducing any kind of new products. That always you know, makes it a much more difficult process, I think. It adds time to the process. 
what we really looked at was using the two best products uh, as our major uh, agents and getting rid of the other products. And as we got rid of the other products, we actually, you know, discovered that we had, uh, we didn't need as much because we would put more of our prepping agents into our custom kits or our supplies in a box um, so that we just didn't need to stock as much. We actually were not able to go back and look at any real cost savings in relationship to that. Uh, we may, in fact, capture more uh, of the um, cost just because we actually do get fairly good reimbursement for our uh, custom kits. Also, the manpower that you need to actually be doing all of the stocking of the uh, supplies really was cut down. You know, the, the uh, Prepping devices come in through our materials management. It has to be unboxed. It has to be put on a cart. It has to be moved from that cart over to a stocking cart that goes up to the operating room. Then it has to be moved over to each one of the individual operating rooms. Uh, so we really cut down on the amount of time that it actually took to uh, actually do all that. So just continuing to look at the processes and make sure that, uh, once again, as I say, we are getting the results that we really want uh, in relationship to it. So uh, making sure that surgeons were on board um, and um, certainly the uh, ones that practice at Stanford were really involved in the whole process. And it was just trying to catch up with all of our surgeons that kind of come and go and are not there on a routine basis. Um, making sure that we do have some kind of audits in place so that we can, in fact, um, make sure that um, everything is on track. And once again, I can't you know, talk enough about the fact that um, the electronic record has made a retrieval of information so uh, much easier for us. Um, the list of the uh, prepping agents uh, is very easy for uh, the nurses to use. And it comes in um, you know, on the preference card and actually in the, in the kit. I, I truly can't um, um, talk uh, about the fact that you really need to actually stay connected to your uh, manufacturer representatives because, you know, with the change in the um, micro um, makeup of our um, of patients and the fact that we have so many patients who have vanco resistant organisms and they have, you know, we have C diff and all those, the manufacturers are constantly looking to improve their products. So staying connected to them and having them support you during uh, these kind of changes is, is really critical and providing um, really good education at, for the nursing staff is, is very critical um, during this time. So um, one of the things that you also need to think about is the fact that you need to include the patient in the um, in this whole process. So when we talked about having the um, CHG, uh, the pre-op bathing thing, uh, we needed to develop education um, tools for the patients so that, you know, it's one of those things that the nurse practitioner tells them, you know, this is how you're going to use it. Um, if you don't have some kind of literature for them to take home so that they can reinforce uh, and actually make sure that um, they're doing it correctly, um, which is what we want um, to be helpful. So also we needed to make sure that the surgeon's offices, if they were going to be the, the personnel that were going to actually be delivering it, that they understood what um, the uh, expectations were for the patients. 
Um, and certainly, obviously not, and you have to be selective about, you know, making sure that the personnel who are handing it out understand which patient should, in fact, uh, be getting this because, um, and making sure that they understood that if the surgery was going to be on their face, we didn't expect them to actually be using some of these on their face. Um, so some kind of uh, written documentation for the patient to actually have to uh, have it be available. And, you know, we need to make sure, as I say, that this is not just a uh, one-pronged process. This is uh, incorporating many different things into uh, preventing surgical site infections. So, and one of the things that we need to remember is that the skip measures actually were designed for this. So the Surgical Care Improvement Project um, is also part of this. Even though the um, patient prepping is not, quote, included in the skip measures, we still track on it. So it's as important as the antibiotics and the hair removal and keeping the patient warm and making sure that their blood glucose is in, in the right uh, frame. So we need to really think about this as a whole package of surgical site infection uh, reduction. And standardizing it, once again, we go back to what our objectives were and what our patient goals are is, you know, we need less waste. There's less healthcare dollars out there today for us to actually waste. And making sure that the, the patient is the center of our um, process and that we are doing the best. And standardizing protocols and prevention for um, different aspects of care are very beneficial. Um, I think the one major thing that we have seen in the last year is the timeout process, which includes many uh, steps that we need to take and put into place. Uh, and even though the prepping is not part of that process, um, it still is a very vital uh, item that we need to actually deal with. Um, I hope I've given you uh, some ideas uh, today. Um, it wasn't a difficult uh, process for us. Uh, we've taken on much larger and much more complicated processes, uh, but it seems to be effective and it seems to have been positive for the staff and the patients and everybody concerned. So uh, thank you very much and look forward to now listening to uh, questions that you might have. Okay, well thank you Sharon for a very informative presentation. and. Just a reminder, we're now going to start the Q&A portion, and you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Um, we do have a few questions coming in, so I'm just going to start off with the first question we have here, and that is, do you have evidence for using sterile versus clean gloves for prepping? Uh, no, but I did just read a recommendation. Uh, there was in one of the AORN, uh, I don't know whether it was the weekly periop or um, I think that's exactly where I found it. That was a question. Um, what they said in that um, from AORN was that if you need to wear gloves, if you're not going to be touching the patient per se, such as if you have to prep a limb uh, where you would actually need to touch the limb, then you need to put on sterile gloves. If you're not going to be touching, you can just use uh, regular gloves that you use for uh, personal protection. Um, I will tell you that a number of years ago, uh, it's probably been 15, I would guess, that we actually did a project that was sponsored by AORN on not using sterile um, gloves or sponges and things uh, in relationship to doing uh, abdominal preps. And we actually saw no issues around that. 
I mean, once you basically touch the patient's skin, you know, you're, you've contaminated them. You've contaminated your supplies. You haven't contaminated the patient. But um, as you can see, that didn't actually catch on any place. So. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we, we have another question is, what electronic medical record is used in your facility? Uh, we are using Epic, um, and our first product was Pisces. Uh, but we moved away from uh, Pisces because it wasn't a global process. Uh, it wasn't a global record. It was specific for the operating room. And we chose Epic uh, because it had more functionality for all of the other areas that needed to be um, actually uh, documented. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we have a question here. What is essential for successfully presenting the new protocol to staff? I, I think it's, you know, making sure that they understand that this was a decision that actually the physicians made themselves. Uh, it was supported by nursing management and it was also uh, supported by the infection control practitioners. And when we presented what we found in the literature, that it was very sound. Plus the fact that we had all of the outside agencies that actually supported uh, our thought processes. Okay, great. Are you using CHG bath post baths post op? Yes. The nurses do use those uh, on the nursing units um, for uh, post-op uh, care. And they ha actually have these nice little warmers so that the patient doesn't have to have the uh, cold one that he probably got to use at home. OK, thank you. Do you document who preps? Yes, we do. Um, the nurse has to document who the prepper was, whether it be the physician or the nurse. 99% of the prepping in our organization is done by the nursing staff. I know in other teaching facilities that I've worked at, it was either the resident or the attending doing the prepping, and that's not very common with us. If, in fact, we have to shave the patient in the operating room, then that's also documented and who did that. OK, great. Can you please elaborate on your process for the measurement and tracking of the progress after new protocol has been presented? And what did you find to be most helpful or successful? Well, as I say, it's we, we actually track on a, a big percentage of our patients. All the orthopedic patients have to be tracked. All the cardiac patients have to be tracked. And certainly, we were more cognizant of things uh, after we made this um, prep change. And we already had an electronic record, so infection control could really monitor it. But I have to stress, once again, we could not tie this directly, this change in practice, to our surgical site infection. Um, there's just too many other variables that, that, that we're looking at. Certainly, if we had any infections, then they went back and looked more closely at what were we prepping with, what were other variables that you know, may have uh, occurred with this uh, patient uh, that would actually, uh, the wound would not heal, uh, et cetera. So, you know, diabetic patients, um, you know, patients with chemotherapy. We have a huge population of, of cancer uh, treatment patients. So um, it really could not necessarily have a direct relationship uh, with the surgical site infection rates. OK, thank you, Sharon. Uh, this next attendee asks, would you please share experience of how to engage surgeons to agree on standardization? Well, certainly some things are easier than others. 
what I discovered with this uh, particular process was the fact that surgeons either really don't have any kind of vested interest in what you you know prep your his patient with his or her patient with, or they go completely to the other extreme, and they're almost it's almost like a religious process, and I find that was more common this very uh, fanatic kind of ritualistic process with, with the orthopedic surgeons. And most of the orthopedic surgeons were already using an iota for alcohol preparation, and they still had that available. So we had less problem with the surgeons. Um, I, I would have liked to have been at the meeting when the, this was discussed. I, I think most of the surgeons were cognizant of the fact that we really did need something that came commercially prepared, that it actually had a, a recipe that was followed and consistent. And, you know, all of our surgeons are really want to be on board, and, and they don't want to be bringing patients back uh, because of surgical site infections. That, you know, reflects on them a, as well as the institution. So. Uh, this was an easier sell. Um, I can tell you there's other projects that we have done that have been extremely difficult and extremely confrontational. Uh, this just happened to not be one of those. Okay, thank you. We have time for just a couple more questions. This next question is, what company produces the poster holders at the scrub sinks? That would be a great way to communicate. Yeah, it really is, and I will have to look it up, um, and I, you know, uh, I will get back to you with what the name of the company is. Okay, thank you. And for our final questions, if you cannot link your intervention to a decrease in SSIs, why bother? Well, we had agents that we shouldn't have been using, and we just know that if you're using the best product that we will have a positive outcome for the patient. Um, but there are just too many other things for us to be able to say this actually is a result of the protocol for prepping the patient's skin. And standardization is kind of what the name of the game is all about. Not a, having a lot of choices, but having the best choices for your patient. Okay, thank you, Sharon. And for all the attendees, if you have additional questions after the webinar, you may contact um, infection control, that would be all one word, infection control at C C A P as in Peter R dot com. So that's infection control at ccapr.com. I want to thank everybody who attended the webinar today and thank Sharon for presenting such a great webinar. We look forward to having you join us again for future webinars and this will conclude today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>